Have you ever wondered how successful architecture, engineering, and construction companies scale their business? Or have you ever wanted guidance on how to get more growth, wealth, and freedom from your AEC company? Well, then you are in luck. Hi, I'm Will Forat. And I'm Justin Nagel, and we're your podcast hosts. We interview successful AEC business leaders to learn how they use people, process, and technology to scale their businesses. So sit back and get ready to learn from the industry's best. This is Building Building Scale. Hey listeners, it's Will here. Our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. If you've ever listened to our show, then you know that the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. So if you suspect technology is your weak link, then book a call with us to see where we can help maximize your company's IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. Today's guest is Charlie Popek, a recognized authority and leader in the field of building science, sustainability, and green building. Charlie is the president and founder of Green Ideas Building Science Consultants. Since they established in 2002, Green Ideas has managed and certified over 100 LEED certified projects and has been involved in more than 150 sustainable projects throughout the Americas. Charlie's role at Green Ideas encompasses operations, business development, marketing, educational programs, and technical consulting. With a lifelong career in the construction industry, Charlie brings a wealth of experience having worked on a wide range of commercial, industrial, and residential projects. Charlie's passion for high-performance design and construction combined with his unique background as a tradesman makes him one of the most versatile building science consultants in the country. He champions a holistic approach to sustainability, emphasizing the integrated design process and evaluating each project from a business perspective. In addition to the project consulting, Charlie has educated over 40,000 industry professionals worldwide from more than 2,500 companies helping them become lead accredited. And with all that said, Charlie, we welcome you to the show. Thank you for having me, Justin. Yeah, that, um, I, I, the numbers, they, they come out of my mouth funny. 40,000 and 2,500. Um, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of companies that you've had massive impact on. So we're really excited to hear about all of your uh, impact that you've had, not just on those individuals, but the uh, the business world and then the actual world. Uh, so tell us tell us your origin story. Tell us a little bit about you. How'd you get in construction? How'd you get into lead uh, specifically? And then t- talk to us about Green Ideas. Well, those numbers are very big because I'm very old. So, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. This is my 21st year in business here with Green Ideas. So we're kind of proud of that. So we've had a lot of time to build up those numbers. But, uh, yeah, as far as my background, I was born and raised in Washington, Pennsylvania, southwestern Pennsylvania, and I served my carpentry apprenticeship there and uh, moved out west when I was a young man, went to Cal Poly Pomona, got my building uh, a science degree there. And, you know, had just various jobs for architects and engineers and contractors over the years. And then uh, once I finished my MBA, I went to work for a product company and they considered themselves to be a green product company. And so I got involved with the Scottsdale Green Building Program, which is one of the more prominent green building programs in the country. I know Austin, Texas has a good one, uh, many in California, but uh, Scottsdale's program headed up by Anthony Floyd was very well known. Anthony's a building code specialist. In fact, you should probably connect with him one day because quite an interesting guy. And uh, anyway, uh, this was about the year 2000, right when the U.S. Green Building Council, or USGBC, had introduced LEED to the public in 1999. And they said, hey, uh, we want to Um, make this thing grow a little bit more. So we're going to open up uh, or or offer uh, organizations the opportunity to open up a chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council. And so the group I was involved with, the Scottsdale Green Building Program, we said, let's go ahead and do it. 
So, you know, we had to start our, our own 501c3 nonprofit. And so we hired a lawyer and did all that. And, and we were awarded chapter status in 2002. And we were the second chapter ever in the country. And that grew to, I think, about 87 chapters at one point in time. And so, you know, in Arizona, we're really uh, leaders in many ways in helping with the whole green building movement. So uh, after that, you know, I was uh, the on the board of directors of the nonprofit and I was the education committee chairman. So I would be the guy that would go out and do lunch and learns for architects and engineers and contractors, teaching them about sustainable design and construction and the LEAD program. Uh, LEAD stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, and it's a, a green building certification for buildings, but it's also an accreditation for people. So say if you wanted to become a lead accredited professional like me, also known as a lead AP, uh, you would go take a 100 question exam about the lead program and you could become a lead accredited professional. Well, I was one of the first people in the country to pass that exam. And then, uh, you know, I'd be out teaching architects, engineers, contractors about the program on behalf of the U.S. Green Building Council. And so then companies started asking me to come in and, hey, can, can you uh, pop in and teach our people, uh, you know, say a, an architecture firm, can you teach our people about the LEAD program in sustainable design and construction? And then that turned into, hey, can you come in and help us to um, uh, help our people to pass the LEAD exam? So, you know, I, I've done many private seminars uh, we called them lead exam preparation seminars to help people pass that exam. And then, you know, I'd do public seminars. So I'd say, hey, I'm going to be in Santa Barbara, California on December the 20th to do a, a seminar. So we did that for many years. So probably the first, uh, I would say, five or six years in business. And I started the business in 2002. Uh, I would, uh, you know, uh, it was it was a big part of my business, you know, the education component. And then, of course, I use that as a, uh, a springboard for business development. So when I was doing these seminars, you know, everyone in the audience is a potential future client. So when these architects and engineers and contractors would uh, get a new project and and there was a lead requirement on it, hey, they'd call the teacher, they'd call Charlie. And, and so my business evolved from mainly uh, education in the first few years to more of a consulting type of a practice. And that's kind of where we're at now. That's interesting because you uh, effectively created your uh, future clientele. Like that, like, you know, not many people can say like, I built my clientele by educating them for years, you know, we got, got, got some paid there, but then made them my future clients, uh, in, in transformed the business. That's super intriguing. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty cool business development project and it worked very well. Uh, and of course there's still people out there that, uh, want to become lead accredited professionals. In fact, I teach at ASU as well as the School of Architecture here in Scottsdale. And, you know, a lot of these organizations, these universities like to prepare their students that are in the architecture program or the construction management programs like they have at the Delhi Web School of Construction at ASU to earn that lead accredited professional status upon graduation. So I've taught many of these seminars at universities around the country. I did it at Princeton University at one point in time. And so, you know, I've lectured at quite a few universities around the country, helping people to become lead accredited and teaching about integrated design and construction and operations of buildings. And it's, it's kind of involved into a great business for me. That, um, that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think running through, again, through business development, operations management, the whole, like, you know, 
to, to your point of being holistic, right? Like it's all about the holistic approach to it. So that, that makes sense. Let's, uh, let's talk about people. Let's talk about how, uh, building a team of, of, of greenies, as some people call it. I don't know if that's good or bad to say greenie or not, if it, it it's the right term or not, but, um, what, what did that look like? Some people, um, when you, when you lead with purpose or you lead with something that's not just uh, monetary, um, what does that look like uh, having, you know, building a team around you uh, at Green Ideas? Right. Well, that was an exciting part of the business early on. As far as the, the green term goes, you know, the organization, the nonprofit organization that developed LEAD mm-hmm. is called the United States or U.S. Green Building Council. And okay. so what we're doing a lot is the, a lot of people refer to it as green building, which I'm okay with, but I really think that term's a little bit overused. Sometimes uh, you you hear the term sustainable design Mm -hmm. and construction. I prefer the term high performance design and construction because that's really what we're creating. High performance buildings that use less energy and use less water and are healthier for people. So that's what we're doing. That's what it's all about for me. And it doesn't have to cost more to do it. So in the early years, you know, there were a a few of these greenies, as you put it, you know, the the people that were passionate about sustainability, maybe didn't even have much of an architecture or engineering or construction background that, you know, wanted to go to work for the company. So I, uh, I did hire several folks that were architects and engineers in the early days, but some weren't. Some were product specialists. And of course, we had admin people because the LEAD program is really a documentation-based program. Um, you know, you have to document everything you do. It's it's a points program. So for instance, if you get 40 of the 110 points available, your building would earn a certified level certification. If you get to 50 points, you would be a silver certified building. If you get to 60 points, gold certified. And if you get to 80 points or more out of the 110 total, your building would be certified as a platinum level building. So uh, I had a lot of... uh, Passionate people about sustainability working for me over the years, and uh, they've gone on to uh, lead other companies over the you know over the last twenty one years that I've been in business here, and uh, they're still out there doing it. So I'm kind of proud of you know teaching these people about high performance design and construction and getting them into the industry, and many of them are leaders now. So it was fun. I, so you, uh, I love that you phrase it as high performance. So let's talk about that, right? So people um, maybe on the outside that have not uh, really dove into the lead buildings or um, more sustainable structures or, uh, how, you know, again, all the many ways to phrase it, but you're saying, it, well, it's high performance. So that to me sounds like, oh, well, that sounds good. You know, high performance, everybody wants high performance. Who doesn't want high performance? So um what does that actually mean like in a business sense? Like, so I'm building a building. I can choose to make it lead or not, uh, depending on the location I'm at. Why, why go and choose to have a high performance building in comparison to a, I guess, a, a regular performance building. Well, you know, there, there's uh, the building code out there. No matter where you're in the design or build a building, and whether it's New York or Arizona or Washington State, wherever you're at, there's building codes that you have to follow. So mm-hmm. that the building code is the minimum that you have to do, right? You have to meet the building code requirements with your design or you won't get a building permit, right? So really, if you think about it, uh, a building code building, which happens every day, is the cheapest building you can possibly build, right? There's there's really no minimums to speak of as far as per, the performance from an energy or water perspective, right? But when you think about a, a green building, a sustainable building, or as I prefer, a high-performance building, 
right? Uh, you're, you're mainly focusing on energy and water and people and waste. So you want to reduce your energy usage, reduce your potable water usage within the building. You know, maybe use water twice or three times. Very important in the uh, desert, southwest yeah. especially. And then, of course, you do uh, reduce your waste during the construction process. And, of course, reduce the waste during the operation of the building. And then there's the people element. So in this, as an example, we did uh, the first five lead platinum level certified buildings in the state of Arizona. One of them was the Applied Research and Development Building at NAU, Northern Arizona University. Uh, they call it the ARD Building, Applied Research and Development. And the owner was very committed to a high performance lead building. So from day one, we focused on the lead platinum designation. And it then that particular building is a laboratory and office building. Well, as you probably know, and a lot of your listeners may know that a, a, a laboratory building is very energy intensive, right? And most people can see that, hey, you know, energy is the sexiest thing, right? And, and you can understand if we're saving energy, we're saving money every month on the operation of that building, right? So that very energy intensive laboratory building saves 91% on its energy cost as compared to a standard uh, ASHRAE baseline. So the, the baseline for energy use in a lead building is the ASHRAE 90.1 energy standard. So the more you get below that with your energy use, you get more and more and more points towards your lead certification. So we were targeting lead platinum. And so we wanted an energy efficient building as well as water efficient. The other things I mentioned, but that building that uses a lot of energy, that building type, the laboratory saves 91% on its energy. So, I mean, think about that at your home. If you had a $100 typical energy bill at your house for, you know, your lights and your HVAC, et cetera, you would now be spending $9 a month as opposed to $100 a month on your energy. And the same is really true for water and waste. But again, most people can see the energy. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the most exciting thing out there. But there's many other elements that come into play when you're designing and building and operating a high-performance building. So really, when we're talking about business here, the trade-off is short-term, potentially higher costs in building materials uh, and construction design for a long-term savings that should overwhelmingly uh, reduce your costs over a long period of time. So you have to holistically look at the building as both the initial construction project as well as the long-term maintenance or you know the long-term side to see what the total cost or total value of the building is going to be and whether or not you're saving more or less. So upfront costs, if you're saving a little bit of money on the on the upfront side may actually cost you a lot more on the long term. Exactly right. It doesn't pay to build a, a cheap building, right? And I like everything that you just said, except it might be a higher upfront cost. It does not have to cost more upfront. In, in our world, we call that first cost or initial cost. But really what we focus on is life cycle cost. So there's five elements to life cycle cost. Of course, it's the dreaded first cost, right? Everybody thinks this uh, high performance building has to cost more. Well, it, uh, it does not. And I can give you some examples of that if, if you'd like me to. But we, we look at the first or initial cost. That's the first element. Then we look at the operations cost and we look at the maintenance cost of a building. Then we look at the refurbishment cost, because if an owner is in that building for any amount of time, 
5, 10, 20, 30 years, they're probably going to do some type of remodeling or whatever. So we have that refurbishment cost and then the ultimate disposal cost of a building when it reaches the end of its useful life. So those are the five elements of life cycle cost, which we have to consider and all owners should consider when they're designing and building a new building. Unfortunately, in our world, in the AEC, the architecture, engineering, construction, and real estate world, most of the focus is on first costs. But if you do it right, it doesn't have to cost you more up front than on those initial costs. And then you're ripping, reaping those savings for the next 10, 15, 20 years that you're in the building. That That's the business perspective of high performance design and construction. And that's what we focus on at Green Ideas. Well, yeah, it'd be great to get some examples of that first cost not, not being more expensive. Because I think that's probably, and to what you're saying, is more myth than reality, or at least sometimes is that way. Um, because I think that's probably what pushes people away. They hear a lead and then they think, oh, you mean more expensive. You know, obviously there's more to it, but like that's the initial thought, uh, which then deters them from from choosing to build the lead building. Yeah, and I, I'll give you a great example of it. I think we talked about this at one time in the past, Justin, that on the Phoenix Convention Center, the West mm. Bill the largest construction project at the time ever in the state of Arizona. Uh, we got a call one time from Leo Daly Architects. They were designing that West building. And at this point in time, there's a big hole in the ground in downtown Phoenix. And they, they were under construction, right? With Hunt Construction, uh, a national contractor that has a presence here in Arizona, was the contractor, the GC, general contractor for the project. Well, what happened on that project was the assistant city manager for the city of Phoenix went out of town somewhere to a conference of city managers. Uh, the city manager for Phoenix uh, talked to other city managers from around the country, and she realized that conventions really aren't going to convention centers any longer unless they have some type of a sustainability component or they're lead certified, mm -hmm. right? It's just like they say, you should watch what you buy, right? That's your home. You buy sustainable products. So, so she said, wow, if we want this new convention center that we're building to be a, a successful business venture, you know, we better do that lead certification that's out there. So she came back from her convention, talked to the architect and said, hey, we need to do this right away. So the architect called us and said, hey, can you come on in and, you know, give us a price to help us do the lead certification? Well, they were at 90 percent CD completion. And CD is construction documents. So for uh, I'm assuming that a lot of your listeners know about the design phases, right? And the, the design phase called construction documents or CDs is the last phase uh, before the plans and specifications are complete. So your CDs, your construction documents are a set of plans and a set of specifications to go with those plans. It tells the contractors how and what to build, what what materials to use, et cetera. So this building at that time was 90% designed. So when the owner, the city manager comes to the architects and says, hey, we want a high performance building. What does the architect have to do? They have to go back and redesign, right? And this happens all the time. So, you know, uh, when you you and I talked in the past, you know, I said that, hey, you know, these architects and engineers and contractors, they're really nice people, you know, but they're in business. And if they design your building twice, they're going to probably have to charge you more money. And then people say, oh, this lead thing costs more. You know, well, yeah, it costs more if you don't do it right. And if you design your building twice, or three times, right? So the, the moral of the story is to start early. If you start early and you know from day one, like the building at NAU I told you about, they know that knew they wanted a high-performance 
lead platinum building from day one. You've designed the building once. And, you know, in the past, the materials, yeah, they did cost a little bit more. But in this day and age, they do not cost anymore. So if you do it right, you start early, you know what your goals are for the building. High performance building does not have to cost more initially or those upfront costs. And you reap the benefits of the life cycle cost. That's that's what we're about. So what was the end result for the convention center? And the end result, they got LEED Silver certification, and it only cost them 3% more up front. But, of course, on a large building, 3% is more, but it didn't have to cost them 3% more if they knew what they wanted early enough. Got it. Why, why would somebody not choose a LEED building in, in the commercial space or in like in that situation, a convention center, but, like, that to me makes sense. Like if you're building a convention center today, just based on what this story, well, yeah, of course you have to have a lead building. Otherwise you won't get the business. And then it's like, why did you build this giant structure to not have anybody in there uh, half the time? Um, so what's, what's the case for say a skyscraper or something? What's the case for, um, I don't know, even an industrial uh, piece of property? Well, a few things, but number one, as you mentioned earlier, it's that, common misconception that it has to cost more sure. and when you when you talk about costs in the AEC industry most AEC professionals know about first cost and that's all they know about. even in this day and age in in, in 2023 that's really of what a lot of design and construction professionals focus on because it is a first cost oriented business right if if you're going to build your new home you probably have a budget right you can afford two hundred fifty thousand dollars to build this home well if you think that a, a high performance sustainable home costs a lot more up front you're probably going to be like uh, you know let's cut this out let's cut that out but if you know what you want up front it doesn't have to cost you any more initially if you don't, it will cost you more initially. So that's the, that's the biggest hurdle, let's say, out there in the industry that uh, I've been combating now for 21 years since I founded Green Ideas. But that's why I like the education component. Because, you know, when I'm teaching people about sustainable, high-performance design, you can sometimes see those light bulbs gone off over people's heads and say, you know what, that makes sense to me. If we if we do this thing right, we know what we want up front, we specify the right materials, and hire the right team, team members that understand what we're doing, it doesn't have to cost me more. So it's it, it's all those things and more. So um, the people you choose to help you with your project are also very important because believe it or not, again, in 2023, there's a lot of design professionals out there that have very little knowledge about what we're doing. And, and that amazes me because it all, all it is is good design. That's what they teach in architecture school. I mean, why would they teach a to design a building that is not an energy efficient building, right? The, that's what they teach, energy efficiency and water efficiency. But somehow, you know, you get out of school and you get into the real world and we got to focus on the cost, you know, the first cost and bring them down. And, and there's that common misconception out there to this day. I feel like if people, uh, learned sales or sales aspects more at a younger age, the world would be a better place. Because if you could, if you like, if you get to talk to Charlie about lead and like, why does it make sense? It's like, oh, well, sure. Even if I had to pay more over time, I get all that money back. So, right. and then some, so like, it just makes sense. But like when you take a young professional an architect, whatever, and it's like, you know, when they get posed, why would I want platinum status? It's like, they they may bumble and not have a confident answer upon why, and then inherently it's like, well, back to non lead buildings because I don't have I don't have a good way to present the facts. So um, yeah, that's, exactly. that's 
You're exactly right on that. And, you know, you're, we're talking about lead here because that is the most well-known, well-recognized rating system out there for green buildings, for high-performance buildings. But there's other rating systems out there, too. You know, there's the Living Building Challenge, uh, local programs like that Scottsdale Green Building Program I was telling you about earlier. Uh, there's the BREAM program. There's a lot of different rating systems available to design and construction professionals on the market. Uh, most of them are voluntary. Uh, some uh, municipalities, some state governments do require LEED or other certifications for their buildings, but most do not. So Outside of direct, you know, direct benefit or long-term benefit, are there indirect benefits to designing uh, and building, you know, LEED certified buildings? Well, probably the biggest one that the indirect benefits that a lot of people don't think much about is the people factor, right? Because when we're designing energy efficient water efficient buildings that have more fresh air ventilation coming into the building and when we're daylighting the building to cut down on energy costs because you're using natural light well guess what that's also helping people to be more healthy and more productive in fact you know the epa says that individuals like all of us, we spend 90% of our lives inside of buildings. Look at that, the three of us right now. We're inside of a building. That's why we build buildings, to put people in, to go to school or go to work or go to a factory and build things. You know, that's what buildings are for, for people. So uh, when you can design buildings that save energy and water and cost less to operate, uh, they're also healthy for people, right? Because again, we, we, we design buildings to daylight buildings, like I mentioned, and bring more fresh air ventilation into the building, that sort of thing. In fact, there's a new rating system out there called the WELL rating system, W-E-L-L. And it's been developed by the same organization that developed LEED. Um, and it, it focuses more on human health and well-being rather than so much energy efficiency and water efficiency and such. So especially with the whole COVID thing that happened over the last few years, you know, there's many major organizations that are targeting well certification for the buildings along with lead they're complementary you don't have to do one or the other but some of these programs out there today are just focused on human health and well-being which makes sense because again you know we're human beings we're supposed to be out there we are we're mammals we're animals we're supposed to be out there but we spend 95, 90% of our time in here. So anything we can do to make that connection to the outdoors, like I said, by providing fresh air ventilation or views to the outdoors. If you're sitting at your desk at work and you can look to the left or the right and you can look out through a window and make the connection uh, to nature, to the outdoors, you're more productive and you're, you're, you're healthier and uh, talk about another business benefit. You know, they say even an incremental increase in employee productivity pays huge financial benefits for business owners. So not necessarily a building owner, which is true, but a business owner. So many companies now are, requiring, you know, daylighting and such. And, you know, they're looking like good corporate citizens, which they are, but guess what? They're saving a ton of money operating their buildings too. For instance, there's a, the Bank of America built the first super high rise in downtown New York City. And it was the first high rise to get lead platinum level certification years ago. Let me tell you, Bank of America is not building LEED certified buildings because it's costing them more. 
right? They're doing it because they're saving a ton of money operating that building. And they look like a good corporate citizen. So open the windows, uh, let in the air, let in the light get, <laughs> for the simplicity of it. But uh, at at the level of, hey, you when you make an environment better for your employees, uh, which I, I love, they they produce more. So um, at the end of the day, business, you still got to make production. You got to make profit. You got to make all those things. Um, so let's do it in the way that make doing the right thing effectively is 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 also benefiting uh, the checkbook in this case. Yeah. And even uh, going back to Will's question, you know, some of the secondary benefits, one that I'd love to mention is uh, insurance premiums. You know, years ago, there was a study done about how insurance companies are now offering reduced premiums for LEED certified buildings. Why? Because if you're a building owner, business owner, and people aren't getting sick in your building, guess what? You're not getting sued. There's no, you know, lawsuits against your company. You're saving on legal bills and such. And, you know, you it's less less maintenance on those buildings in the meantime. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's something that people really don't even consider much. But there's reduced insurance premiums for these buildings, too. And who would think of that, right? When you're designing a building and building, you're thinking about architects and engineers and contractors, right? No one thinks of insurance premiums. Well, Hey, guess what? That's part of my business expenses if I'm uh, a business owner, right? So it's lowering my insurance costs now. We love the insurance uh, indirect value. We see that in the IT and cybersecurity side. When we implement cybersecurity solutions, um, you can totally see a, dis a discount in your, your insurance uh, premiums because like you're doing things that will you know prevent the, the claims from happening. Right, like that's effectively. Hey, the they're gambling. They have their uh, their numbers. People saying like, all right, well, what's the likelihood? And if the likelihood is decreased so significantly, then yeah, we can give it can be cheaper for you. Absolutely, yeah. So, so any of those uh, items that I mentioned could be considered, you know, business advantages. Oh, yeah. right. And plus, you know, not to mention employee acquisition and employee retention. You know, and people want to work in these buildings, right? They want to go to school in these buildings. Arizona State University. Go Devils. Uh, yeah, they made a commitment to lead back in 2005, I believe, that everything they build on campus is a lead silver level certified building at a minimum. City of Scottsdale committed to lead gold level back in 2005. So any building in the city of Scottsdale that has, you know, taxpayer money, city money involved with it has to be lead gold. And that was the most stringent com commitment of any city in the, in the country at the time. And I know there are several others out there now. And, you know, I guess going back again to, to Will's question, uh, we worked on a project in Las Vegas several years ago and the state of nevada office of energy is one of the states that offers in tax incentives for lead certification so you can get up to 50 percent of your property taxes abated for up to 10 years so think if you could save 50 percent of your tax bill for 10 years and that's what this organization that built a one of these mega uh, Las Vegas resorts up there that we worked on was focused on. And it's so smart of the state of Nevada to do that because, you know, let's face it, that Colorado River's uh, drying up, right? And the, uh, the, uh, uh, energy is that's generated for by that water flowing through the Colorado River and through the Hoover Dam, right? It's uh is what generates the electricity. Well what are, what are we what's gonna happen in Las Vegas when that river dries up? You know, that's gonna be a, a problem. So uh, they're, they're being proactive. They really are. So the, the state of Nevada Office of Energy incentives are some of the most lucrative in the country.
That's so much money. I can't even imagine 10 years, 50% off your tax for a, a, a casino resort in Vegas. I have to imagine that's insane money. That's, uh, well, you know, that's billions Vegas. of dollars. That's billions of dollars at this point. It is. It, it is. In fact, we did a calculation. And, you know, this is one of these mega resorts, right? This is, uh, I think they, I don't know, 3,000 some hotel rooms. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh seven pools, all types of amenities there, right? And it, it, it is just a huge, huge project. And that owner was going to receive like, uh, I think it was a $65 million tax incentive from the state of Nevada for getting lead silver. And then they have a program where, you know, if you hit the lead silver with the minimum amount of points, you get... X amount of tax incentive. If you get lead silver plus two points, two additional lead points, you get more of a tax incentive. Plus four points, you get more of a tax incentive. So there's really good uh, incentives there to encourage, encourage buildings to be more and more energy efficient and more and more water efficient. So that's that's some of the things that's going on out there in the world. Well, if you didn't cover your costs initially, didn't think you could c cover your upfront costs, if this doesn't tell you that you can cover your costs, I don't know what will. So I hope people heard that. Pretty much every building should be LEED certified is what I, what yeah. I really hear. Exactly, or some type of certification. And, you know, I, I, I'm a big proponent of the third-party certifications like LEED. But I also say, hey, you know what? If, if you're not going to do the certification, uh, just just do all the things that the certification requires, you know, <laughs> make sure you implement low flow fixtures and energy efficient lighting and HVAC equipment. I mean, it's it's none of this is rocket science or brain surgery. It's just pretty common sense uh, approach to design and construction of buildings. And if they don't know, ask Charlie. That, that, that's the, the easy <laughs> That's the super easy button. Here to help. So actually, uh, let's talk about that for a second. Um, how has technology impacted LEED? Give us some, you know, before and after, or just give us kind of the uh, state of things when LEED was first implemented versus today, how's technology changed? Because there's okay. multiple different LEEDs, sort of, uh, not just different types, but it's also going through some revisions too. Right. Yeah. Lead started out with version one in 1999, right? And the U.S. Green Building Council continues to uh, evolve and improve lead over the years. So it went from lead version one, I believe it was probably approximately 2004 or so. And I could get you the exact dates, but they went from version one to version two. So when they did that, they made the energy requirements a little bit tougher, a little bit more stringent, and the water saving uh, requirements a little bit more stringent. So it was a li little bit harder to get some of these points. So they're pushing the envelope, which is a good thing, right? So we went from version one to version two. Then they did version 2.1 then 2.2, and then version 3 was introduced approximately 2008, 2009, somewhere in that time frame. Again, they raised the bar a little bit on energy efficiency and water efficiency. And then a few years after that, they came out with the lead version 4, which is the current version of LEED. And there's also a version 4.1. So if you were to register a, a building for LEED certification today, you have the opportunity to, to register it under version 4 or version 4.1. And now they're developing version 5. So they continue to push the limit as time goes on, which we need to do, right? Because with, with uh, climate change and such happening, we need to make our buildings more and more energy efficient. And, you know, many buildings are going to net zero energy 
or net zero water when possible or net zero waste. Those are some of the more important things that are happening out there from a big picture in, in our industry. And I guess more of a micro example, Will, would be uh, LED lighting, right? Now, but a lot of people don't think about lighting when you think about your energy budget for a building, right? Well, when LEED first came out, you know, I guess LEDs were out there, but they weren't really a factor. And then, you know, probably up until the mid 2000s, 2005, 2006, LEDs became more readily available, but they were very expensive. Well, now over the years, the cost of LEDs have come down so far that it, it, it doesn't make sense to even design a building without LEDs in there, right? Because they're they're a lot less expensive. The light is better, and they use virtually no energy. You know, very little energy usage with LEDs. In fact, you know, look at some of the cars when you're driving around town uh, today. If you look at the tail lights when you're behind somebody, you know, we used to have a bulb, right? And in, in those tail lights. Well, now you see all these little dots of light. Those are all LEDs. Why? Because they're more efficient, they're lighter, they're less expensive. So that's just an example of how some of the materials have evolved over the years and become uh, more high performance and the cost has come down on top of it. So uh, LEDs um, is one of the, so lighting LEDs. Um, I have to imagine that anything to do with HVAC, you know, cooling, heating, that has to be the other big place. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but that I would think that that's the other big place where energy um, and efficiency around energy needs to be considered. What, what's been done there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's where we look at a building from a whole building perspective. Um, you know, one of my favorite sustainability principles, not necessarily sustainable building principles, but just general sustainability is everything is connected to everything else. That's one of the principles that I live by, a sustainability principle. Certainly true. When it comes to buildings, right? Everything is connected to everything else in that building. And as you mentioned, well, uh, the cost of HVAC equipment, that mechanical equipment that you install in the building to heat it or cool it or ventilate it is uh, one of the higher cost elements, right? So I think at one point in time, I even shared a, my whole building PowerPoint slide with Justin, and I'd be glad to share that with you guys sometime where it's a simple slide that shows uh, how you look at a building from a whole. And again, it's just one slide with a little chart on and then it shows uh, here's the uh, LED lighting. Well, or, or lighting that might cost, you know, a little bit more if you do this lighting or that lighting. If you look at the energy model that you have to do if when you design a high performance building well that's going to cost a little bit more if you put insulation better insulation or more insulation in the building envelope that costs a little bit more and so i'm going down this list saying well i'm kind of blowing the budget right didn't i say this doesn't have to cost anymore but when you keep going down the list because you did all these things and considered how they interact with one another by doing a computerized energy model or a daylight model when you get to the bottom line that shows the hvac equipment like you mentioned you get a big huge credit for that hvac equipment dollar wise because you were able to right size that HVAC equipment, not downsize, not oversize, not undersize, but right size the mechanical equipment. Because again, you started early, right? And you designed this building as a whole and you were able to really reduce the cost of those mechanical systems that are mo the most expensive systems in the building by a huge amount because you took a whole building perspective. 
So uh, again, I'd be glad to share that slide with you sometime if you guys want to talk a little bit more in detail about it. It's so wild, the similarities, Will, uh, when you think of lead, uh, right-sizing. We say right-sizing about like servers all the time or just technical equipment, right? So when you get in early and you understand the environment early, um, and we find this all the time, it's like you can make better decisions for long-term, which then will make the cost cheaper because you're being proactive upon like, hey, you know, the building needs this type of equipment to, you know, regulate the temperature appropriately. Same thing for the tech side where it's like, hey, you actually don't need a server as big as you think because you, it, it's just unnecessary if it's set up properly and you do some of the things that move data around the right way, condense things, obviously set up of all that. So uh, you're speaking our language, Charlie, for sure. Again, it's sustainability, right? It applies to the IT industry versus the AEC industry. It's it's all the same. It's it's common sense, right? That's we really- think so. We like to believe that for sure. Um yeah. what one thing you did say to me about sustainability, which I, I had to write down and have to ask again, uh you said sustainability is national security. So take me through that statement, which I, I love. So take take our listeners through it. I think we talked about that at one time in the past too, but uh again you know we're uh, we're not energy independent here in our country mm-hmm. we still import a lot of our energy and we're still focused on that oil habit mm-hmm. you know we're on a big oil uh usage habit here in this country so anything that we can reduce uh in our buildings to reduce that energy habit is going to be, you know, a national security issue for us. So we try to encourage things like, uh, you know, renewable energy generation on site where you have your wind turbine or your geothermal system or your solar panels on your site and you're generating your own power, right? What a concept. And so LEED and most of the other rating systems also encourage the use of on-site renewable energy generation. And they also encourage the use of, like in LEED, there's a, a credit there where you can get points for using green power, right? Or you can, uh, what, what that means, the requirements for that are you have to enter into a contract with your utility company to purchase their green power, Right. Well, I often say to my students, well, when an owner does that, do you think they pay more for the green power a little bit and then they send different green power in through the wires? No, that's not what happens. (laughs) They take that extra money and they are required by law to invest that extra money that you're paying for that green power as a building owner. And they invest it in grid source renewable energy projects like that solar panel farm in the middle of the Arizona desert. Or I'm sure if you've ever driven to Los Angeles through Palm Springs, you see all the windmills right there along the freeway. That's considered, you know, grid source renewable energy where you have, you know, thousands of uh, windmills or thousands of solar panels. And, and so that money is used to encourage the development of grid source renewable energy. So again, all that, if you ask me, boils down to national security, right? We're not dependent on some foreign country to supply our energy. So we need to get off the oil habit. So you gave us a whole, I mean, a whole bunch uh this episode uh i want to make sure that when we talk about technology we also talk about automation is there any automation that you've seen that's been impactful or so what in terms of lead oh. oh yeah without getting into too much detail most buildings today most commercial buildings have a building energy automation system where it monitors all the energy usage right uh, uh, let's call it a smart building right because mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what this is here it's a smart building so it enables the facility manager or the facility management staff which is uh, a very important 
member of the AEC staff. We actually refer to it as AECO, but then the O is for operations, right? So uh, the, it enables them to monitor the energy use of all the different energy using systems in the building and make real time corrections to that energy use when needed. And I know you guys are big technology guys and, you know, into IT and all that. Well, uh, a lot of these server buildings, you know, that they use a ton of energy, right? Oh, yeah. Equipment. Well, most of them now are targeting some type of uh, certification to, you know, guarantee that they're going to be using less energy because they're energy hogs, right? So technology is a big part of uh sustainable high performance building much like it is with the, your business well so in terms of data centers i mean those are definitely energy hogs uh oh. the the amount of i mean just a one percent reduction on the ener energy bill is like millions of dollars a year so oh yeah uh i can definitely understand you know why that would be why that would be such a big thing uh, well, yeah, buildings. And you know, we've done several projects for Intel, you know, where they make the computer chips here in Chandler, Arizona. We did uh, several standalone buildings for them that they, they do lead certification for, but we are also able to implement a lead program called Lead EB. The EB stands for Existing Buildings. Uh, so there's different lead programs out there. And again, we could talk for hours about all the different programs. But over the years, the USGBC has also involved, evolved to develop different lead rating systems for different building types. So we have lead for new construction, lead NC. We have lead for core and shell construction, lead CS. We have lead for commercial interiors, lead CI. We have lead for homes. And then we have a program called lead EB, like I mentioned. Well, lead, it's a terrible name, really. It should be lead for operations or lead for facility management. It should be called lead FM, if you ask me, facility management. But it's called Lead for Existing Buildings, Operations, and Maintenance. So years ago, I believe this was 2009 or so, Intel asked us to help them with their Ocotillo campus in Chandler. And, uh, you know, they came to us and said, hey, you know, this we've been building this campus for years. We're not building a, you know, a new building. Or we are, but, you know, it's not like we're just building a new building. You know, how how can we implement the sustainability thing? Well, we suggested that they target the lead for existing building certification. And so we were able to implement and get the whole Ocotillo campus certified under the lead EB program in 2009. And just, you know, one of the numbers there, I know you guys like the numbers too, mm -hmm. uh, that that plant is, I believe, saving over nine million gallons of water per day. And it's wow. Manufacturing cow. Yeah, manufacturing facility in the middle of the desert, right? Say so it takes a lot of water to manufacture computer chips, right? You gotta cool all the equipment down with water and such. So uh, yeah, uh, Intel is looking like a really good corporate citizen for doing this lead certification thing. But guess what? They're saving a ton of money on their operation, oh, yeah. too, which, you know, relates directly to their stock price. Right. They're more profitable. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I'm, I worry about like, oh, how much should I water my plants in the summer? Exactly. <laughs> Not the last nine million. <laughs> um uh, that's awesome this this was great charlie we got one last question for you before we uh before we send you away uh and we ask everybody so if you could go back 20 years what would you tell yourself what advice would you give yourself charlie i would say uh probably 
be a little bit more aggressive <laughs> with with pushing the whole lead thing. Of course, you know, like anybody, you you, you learn as you get older, right? Mm-hmm. So you know, I'm old now, but uh, 20 years ago, I was a little bit younger, and uh, I had a lot to learn. You know, so I like all the questions you guys asked me today. I may not have answered them in quite a satisfying manner. You know what I mean? Because I've learned over the years. So, uh, you know, I, I just think it's all about education. And the more aggressive that you can get with education in any industry, right? Like your industry, if you can uh, educate your clients as to why they should right size all their equipment, you know, it, it, it'd be better for them, better for you, better for the world, right? So I would just say, get maybe get a little bit more aggressive with uh, educating the world, you know, maybe connecting with guys like you who are good at getting from a technology perspective, getting the word out in a, a faster, you know, more more uh, impactful way. That's great. I I wrote that down because um I that's good advice for for me now. So like I I'm I'm, I'm going to take in, and start facilitating that. So uh, I can be your 20 year younger version, Charlie. All right. And I think uh, education more aggressively for sure. Good. Yeah, it's important, right? Cuz if people don't know any better, they're not going to do it, right? Nope, for sure. For sure. And there's, uh, there's if, a little- yeah, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, Charlie, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, well, my website is E Green Ideas. So E like environment, greenideas.com. Uh, you can get a hold of me there anytime. Or my email is Charlie, C H A R L I E at E Green And uh, uh, I, again, our mission is to change the world through high performance design, building, and operations practices. And, uh, you know, we're here to help. That's awesome. Uh, This was great. I'm super happy to have uh, met you and been able to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Hope to see you soon. Yeah. Listeners, I hope you had just as good a time as we had. Uh, And until next time, adios. Adios. Thanks for listening to Building Scale to help us reach even more people. Please share this episode with a friend, a colleague, or on social media. Remember, the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. And our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. So if you think your company's technology pillar could use some improvement, book a call with us to see how we can help maximize your IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. And until next time, keep keep building building scale. scale.